How are you? This is Oliver Fernandez, and today I have Lucianne, and she owns the first woman-owned luxury virtual real estate company on with us. Lucianne, how are you? I am doing great. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Really appreciate you coming and um, sharing your wisdom. So I know a lot about you. I, we, we've talked a couple times now, and uh, you are in real estate, right? Yes, I've been in real estate, believe it or not, for 18 years. Wow, wow. Can you tell me what your journey was like getting into real estate? Yes, so I, I'm an immigrant from Brazil. I came here, didn't know how to speak English, and had $100 in my pocket. And uh, originally, I was an illegal immigrant, so I couldn't work. And I had to have a lot of jobs before I had my ideal job. And on some of these jobs that I've had, I often met people who were very successful. And obviously I was in a mission to figuring out, okay, how do I live the American dream? And as I was meeting people, I always ask you, now what is it that you do for a living? So one particular instance, I, um, I met this young gentleman, he was 18 years old. I was 18 as well. He had bought his first car, brand new, and he also bought a home. And I said to myself, wait a minute, he's my age. I'm working in like a boutique clothing store making $10 an hour. He's already buying a car and a house. What is it that he's doing for a living? And he was a real estate agent. And very often anyone who I met who were doing very well in their life, they were involved in real estate. So I decided to get my real estate license when I was 20 years old. Uh, it was two years of hustle before I was able to work legally here. But um, I got my real estate license and um, I've been in real estate for a long time now, 18 years. Wow, wow. So when you got your real estate license, was it just like, what was the process of you getting it? Did you have to overcome any like mental hurdles to like say that this is, make that decision that this is what you wanna do and to go after it? Got it. I remember the day I quit one of my babysitting jobs um, and the, com the family I worked for was a very, very wealthy family who lived on Park Avenue. I, f I used to fly private with them and I got to experience this luxurious lifestyle with them. And uh, I remember I was so certain that that's what I wanted to do. And about six months later, they sold their $20 million apartment, but they never even considered me because I had no experience. But anyways, no, I was sure I wanted it. I honestly don't even know how I passed the real estate exam because I didn't know how to speak English that well. I didn't understand half of the things that were written on the book, but I figured it out, I guess. I, I, I didn't pass the first time, so I did it again, and then I passed the second time. And I also had a friend who had another friend uh, who was managing a boutique real estate company in Manhattan. I went to about four different real estate offices, and every Every, someone, one of the teachers said, listen, if you go into an office and they're telling you you have to pay for training, it's, it's a scam. So I remember going to every real estate office and almost all of them would say, well, you can join us, but you have to pay $500 for training or $1,000 for training. So I often eliminated those companies in the beginning. And um, the company that I had someone who I knew, he was a commercial real estate broker. And I met him and here I am this, you know, broken up uh, English, this woman who really didn't know anything about the city, he said, listen, I really don't think commercials for you. I think you should really consider residential. Let me introduce you to this other guy. So he introduced me to this guy who was a manager at, at this boutique real estate company. And he said, yeah, you're great, but um, you don't know anybody. You don't know the streets of Manhattan. Uh, I'll get back to you. And I, he wouldn't get back to me. And I would, I call them and email them and call them and email them. I literally harassed the guy <laughs> until he said yes. So I was so persistent that one day he said, fine, I'll give you a chance. So I, I finally, I didn't know. I thought it was so difficult to become a real estate agent because it was so difficult for me. Yeah, I found out you only need to have a pulse and you can get into real estate and be an agent. <laughs> but I had everything against me, right? Because I didn't know the streets of Manhattan. I didn't even know how to take the subway. I didn't know anyone. But I had one thing that most people don't have, work ethic and drive. You know, I was hungry. And that's when I got into real estate. And listen, it wasn't easy. The first three months, I didn't do a deal. And all of a sudden, things just click. And I was working with like 50 clients a month, and I couldn't close any of them. 
because I didn't have any experience. So they set me up with a mentor and the poor mentor was just so drained by having to teach me every step of the process. But eventually about a year in, I, I was doing pretty well, but the company wasn't doing so well. And then I moved to a different company called, uh, at the time it was called City Habitats. Uh, they just got, mer they just merged with uh, the Corcoran Group. And City Habitats was the only company who was innovative who had a listing system because everybody else had a, a bulletin board and all these fax machines used to get the sheets and hang it on the bulletin board. And that one had something computerized and it was just so innovative. This was in 2003. So at the time they offered me, they were looking for an assistant manager and um, they offered me a position to become an assistant manager with the company. Granted, when I went for the interview, the gentleman said, listen, I need somebody with three years of experience with Excel, five years of real estate experience. You need to know PowerPoint. And I knew none of that. And I said to him, I don't know how I came up with these things because English was so difficult for me, but I've said it. And I remember saying to him, I said, listen, I can learn very easily. I promise you, I'm going to be your right hand. I'm going to help you be the number one real estate office in the entire city habitats. And he looked at me and at the time I also bought pres uh, fake prescription glasses because I wanted to look older. <laughs> so I'm looking at the guy and I'm seeing four because I wasn't used to wearing glasses. And what's very fascinating is that he said, listen, I have a lot of other people I'm meeting and I, I remember my heart feeling crushed because I said, he's not gonna hire me. And um, because I didn't have anything he wanted, none. And I left. So this was on a, on a, on a, on a, on a I'm sorry, on a Monday. He said he would get back to me by Friday. So on a Wednesday, I was with my mom and I have family in Brazil and some of my family members um, unfortunately does not come from a, a wealthy background and they really are from a lower class uh, in, in unfortunately difficult, um, they ha live a difficult life in Brazil. And my cousin needed to go to school, but public schools in Brazil are very bad and they're always on strike. So I was talking to my mom, I said, you know, your cousin can't go to school because it's on strike. I think we should help. And I said, absolutely. And I remember my mom said, okay, so her, her tuition will be $40 a month. If you give 40 and I give 40, you would pay for her monthly tuition. And it was a bad month at that time in real estate because real estate, there's good months and bad months, right? So I remember I had $40 in my wallet and my mom said $40. So I looked at my wallet and I said, okay, no problem. I took the $40 and I had nothing left. So I gave it to my mom. As I handed my mom the $40 to help my cousin, my phone rang and it was a guy telling me, he said, listen, congratulations, you're hired. You can start on Friday, you know? So it's to show you the more we give and the more we contribute uh, towards others and helping others, the more it comes back to us. So that Friday I started as an assistant manager. And it's funny because my vision was, okay, I'm gonna start in this little cubicle and you know, I have to grow and it's so funny because little things matter so much. So when I got into the office and they said, the receptionist said, well, do you know where your office is? And I'm walking towards the little cubicles because they had 60 desks. And she said, no, 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 your office is here. And when she opened the door, it was like this 20 foot ceiling, mahogany furniture, a huge office, like with, you know, I just, I was so blown away and it was almost like my vision of being this, this business woman had come, uh, come true. And I took that as an opportunity to grow. And I basically worked so hard and I turned that office into the number one office at City Habitats within the first year. Wow, wow, so, that's so cool. Yeah, so look, I didn't get credit for it, but when I started there, they had 150 transactions a month actually no, about a hundred. And we went to about 250 to 300 transactions a month. And it was very simple. What I did was I brought some structure and systems into that office. And you know, I don't even know how I did it. It just using common sense, right? So I'm thinking, okay, so I would pick the brain of the manager. I'm like, okay, tell me who's the number one agent. 
how is this person number one? Why? And one thing I saw in common was every person who was the most successful person, they had more clients. So I said, okay, so how do we get more clients? He said, well, you have to put an ad in the New York Times, and then we're going to advertise the least expensive properties. We're going to get increase. And then those people, 90% of the time, spend more than what they're calling on. So I said, okay, so tell me, how do you decide what properties to advertise? So I took his methodology of picking the properties, and then I said, okay, let's teach this to the agents. So I implemented the weekly training program where the agents will come in at eight o'clock in the morning. And the reason why we did eight o'clock is because we wanted to weed out agents who are not um, hungry. And most of the times, the ones that wouldn't show up or would show up late is because they weren't serious about the business. And then I brought structure. So the agents had a minimum standard and they had to produce a certain amount of money in order for them to stay in the company. And, you know, and the, the rest was history. So that was the number, the number one office for four years. And then they promoted me to being the office manager. They wouldn't give me a senior manager position, office manager for another location. And in a year and a half, that office became the number one office for five years in a row. Right. So um, I, I have shelves of awards that I didn't even think about that. I was a part of it, you know, Obviously it wasn't me, it was the agents, but I brought structure and I brought culture to make that a great environment. And I was a role model, right? So I did everything. When I was an office manager, I was recruiting, training, doing accounting, banking. And I'm like, looking back now, I was like, wow, how did I do that? Right. I don't even know how I had the energy. But anyway, right. so here I am, you know, 18 years later um, and now owning my own company, you know? That's awesome. That's awesome. So one of the key principles that you, you said back when you were working as the office manager is that you found the model, right? Like you found the best agent in that office. Then you, then you went and understood how to mimic that model. Like what was he, what was that agent doing that was different than everybody else? So then you mimic the model and then to really get your firm really rolling was you mastered the model. And the next thing you know, you exploded, right? And you were able to use that not only in one location, but multiple locations. So okay. That's amazing. That's awesome. So the first location, we were the number one office for four years. But what happened was I was the assistant manager, so I wasn't getting credit for it, really. And then what happened was I was nine months pregnant. I told the guy, I said, listen, I want to be a manager because I was the one doing all the work and they had promoted somebody else, not me. And I said, listen, um, if I'm doing this for this long i'm doing all the work i think i deserve to get promoted and he said well i think i should go have this baby you're about to pop i said fine when i come back i want to be a manager so when they promoted to office manager i um didn't even think i was the one making things happen because i wouldn't get credit for it right mm. but then what i realized was i basically took the same systems that i created from the first office and i implemented in the second office Hmm. They wouldn't give me an assistant manager. They wouldn't give me an, an, an admin. I was doing the work for four people, but then I kept proving myself and I kept giving, okay, fine. Now we can hire, now your office is doing well. Now you can hire an assistant manager. Now you can have an admin. Now you can have, so little by little, I was able to get additional help and that helped grow. But another thing that was also very important is I also realized that the top producing office offices had more agents because it's, it's, it's a, you know, it's a dollar per desk. Like whoever is producing the highest dollar per desk. So it's not only having more agents, but agents that are producing more. And I'm sure it's very similar with the multifamily industry, right? You know, you have so many little, uh, you know, offices, I mean, sorry, or, or, or apartments, you want to maximize the rent for each, right? Anyway, so that was what happened. What was happening? I basically figured out, okay, it's costing me this much per desk. I need to be able to make this much per desk in order for us to be a productive office. Right. If that right. That's yeah, no, I can totally relate to a lot of the, your story because I was actually a, an agent at Bond New York when I first like got into my entrepreneurial journey. So I can definitely relate to a lot of that. Mm -hmm. um, so like you went through so much like people limiting, limiting you and, now you own your own company. It's a virtual real estate company. What is it like now owning your own space and being able to go, this, there, there is no limit, right? There isn't any limit. To, there's no one telling you you can't be the manager. There's no one telling you you can't 
do a hundred deals. How is that? How are you dealing with that now? How are you feeling about that now? So what I, what I'm very grateful for is that I worked with a tiny little company when I started, then I moved to city habitats. And at the time they had 16 offices. So they were a fairly big company. Then I went to work with Douglas Hellman in real estate and they have 5,000 agents and they have um, a big company. And then from there, I went to another boutique company called town residential and they have at the time 10 offices. So I got to see, different size sizes of, of different car, uh, companies. And I also got to see, just give me one second, I'm sorry. I have two teenagers at home, so they were making so much noise, I needed to tell them. <laughs> no, good, I couldn't hear them at all, but we're good. Oh, okay, good. So, um, so then what happened was I got to see these different companies, the way they operated and what made them successful. And the last company I worked for, unfortunately, they went out of business. They actually, they don't say they went out of business. They said they seized the brokerage business because they still have another portion of their company. And I had no choice. I either could go work with another brand and kill myself again and make somebody else rich or... I can do everything I did for somebody else and do it for myself. But I needed to overcome the limiting belief that I don't have a salary. Mm. So I literally had to re -brainwash, to brainwash myself and make myself realize that, wait a minute, let's think this through. The salary I had after paying taxes and everything else, my net, net, I really needed to do like three transactions four maybe high-end transactions to make what I was making as a base salary. Yep. I had bonuses and everything. And the funny thing is like, they always gave me bonuses. I always made more than what the, they expected. So they kept making my bonuses more difficult to achieve because mm. I was always killing it. You know, uh, they never expected me to be able to achieve all of them. And um, so that's basically what I had to realize is just really be realistic and realize what is the truth really? How many deals do I really need to do to be able to make what I was making as a salary, plus all the other benefits of being an entrepreneur. And, um, and that's when I made that decision. Listen, it's still a roller coaster ride. I mean, there's days that is most of the time is amazing, but there are days that are scary, you know, because there's certain things or a lot of things you can't control being an entrepreneur, but you know, you just have to stay focused and find outlets that's going to be able to keep you going and 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 stay strong what do you do to stay focused what do you do because like you're right i mean there's so many things moving on there's all the stimulus there's news there's things going on at the family there's things going on outside there's this politics there's all this stuff what do you do to stay focused i don't watch tv so i actually asked my husband what is going on right now in the world is it you know is there something i should know so i let him watch the news to be able to tell me because i feel like a lot of people kept watching the news and they were like depressed. They are really struggling because it's, it was just bad. It's brainwashing yourself. It's like garbage in, garbage out, right? So I don't put garbage in my head. Uh, definitely exercising to be able to clear my mind because it's very easy to feel sorry for yourself when things are not going so well. Um, and then I also meditate. And meditation has definitely helped me. Tell me about the meditation. I've, I've always wanted to do it. There was a point in time where I was doing it for like five minutes in the morning and then five minutes in the evening, but I got away from that. How has that impacted your life? I mean, it's tremendous because I stopped meditating for a while too. And then you just start getting worried a lot more and things just impact you so much more than when you're, when you're not, when you're meditating. Right. So I actually, I have headphones. I bought this thing that you put in your face and it has head, it has the uh, Bluetooth. It's very comfortable. So you can put it before you go to bed. And then I, you know, I use different ones, but you can even go to YouTube and find whatever it is that you feel like you need. If you need wisdom or if you need sometimes even meditation with prayers. Um, there's also, um, uh, you can do hypnotherapy. 
That's another, if you just Google hypnotherapy, there's different samples of hypnotherapy out there that helps you with different things, focusing, um, accomplishing things, being, there's all kinds. And I fall asleep with it. So it's simple, like you're going to bed anyways. So instead of just closing your eyes, you're putting the meditation and you're closing your eyes and then you fall asleep with it because your subconscious is still listening. Mm. And it's fascinating. Mm. It's mm. fascinating because mm. one thing I realize is that there's something that happens in our lives when we're children, right? So the Tony world, people would know that's the primary question that could either make you very successful or it could break you, right? So when I was a little girl, my grandmother said to me that I was the chosen one. That she mm. said, the future is bright. And she planted that seed in my subconscious and it helped me a lot. But most of the time, people hear from their family and their parents, you're stupid. You know, you're, you're lazy. You're, you know, you don't know what you're doing. And that's the question they ask themselves is, am I good enough? And then their entire life, they struggle because they don't even realize that their subconscious is questioning themselves. Mm. And mm. I was so fortunate to have my grandmother plant that seed and, and write my subconscious that I was going to be amazing, you know? Yeah. So. Yeah, no, that's awesome. I can totally relate to that story because there's so many, like my mom, my grandmother, you know, all the people in my life were always saying really positive things. And like you said, it could, it could, it, it just, it's that foundation that you lean on. Cause as you were saying before, there's people that were not counting you out. You know, they were saying that they were asking for they had the job had all of these requirements and you didn't have any of them, but what kept you going and kept you following up with that person and kept you calling that person is because you had that seed in your head that I am good enough. Right. Yeah. That's awesome. That's re That's really cool. So how's the business doing right now through COVID? I was fortunate enough that I launched my company a year before COVID happened. And I launched the first virtual real estate company that is luxury using blockchain technology. No one knew what the heck I was talking about. They're like, what is a virtual real estate company? I had to explain. I said, a virtual real estate company is a company that does not have brick and mortar and Everything is done digitally. There is no paper. So it was ahead of my time. But COVID helped me because people know what virtual is now. They know you can't go sign a paper somewhere because you couldn't for six months. Right. right. So that has really expedited and it helped me get everybody else in the world, not in New York. See how lucky I am? I'm the chosen one. The entire world adapted to my virtual business. Wow. Look at us now. Yeah, we're virtually having a conversation, building a personal relationship and a report that it didn't exist before. So COVID helped help my business explode. Yeah, no, I you were you were spot on with that. So you started it a year ago, you said. A year before COVID, so it was March twenty first, two thousand nineteen. Okay, and your your big challenge was getting over the limiting belief that you had to have a salary, right? Yes. Yeah. Was that that was the biggest one or was there anything else? Um, I really knew because I was doing it for so long, I, I think there is a threshold, right? That you, you get to a, a point in your life that I just, I was so sick of the politics. I was so sick of working so hard and making somebody else rich, you know? Every time I left one company to go to another, I look back, I'm like, wow, I've made them $10 million a year in revenue. And what do I have? I had nothing. So yeah. I trade dollars for hours. Yep. I was working, getting that salary, but there was no equity in that. Yep. So yep. I've had, look, I've had, I had 40 companies wanting to hire me when that company closed, but all of them would have been salaries. So yep. I was questioning myself, do I want to go back and start working for somebody and killing myself again? Cause I know my human nature. I can't not work hard. It, I'm obsessed with, with success. And I, and I said, I can't do it again. I, I said, I don't want to be sitting in a rocking chair regretting for the rest of my life that I didn't give it a try. Mm, mm, mm. And I think you, you, you have to get to a point in your life. And listen, if this was 10 years ago, I was not ready. I had to go through a lot of pain 
to get to a point of feeling I'm ready. I yeah. went through a lot of great days, but a lot of horrible days, especially when you work with these big corporations. When you have a CEO mindset, you don't think of politics, of like having to worry about people's feelings, right? So let me give you an example. So when I work with a big corporation, I would go into the bathroom and the light bulbs were burned out. I'm like, hmm, okay. So I would tell the receptionist, hey, the light bulbs burn out. And then I will go to the off facilities person and say, hey, just so you know, the light bulb bulbs burned out. And nothing would happen. And then I go a week later, two weeks later, three weeks later. So I then I'll took upon myself and I go to the super. I'm like, can we make sure that the light bulbs changed? And they will get it done. So what happens? I overstepped my boundary. So the person who's charted for city is pissed off because I'm getting involved in their business. I'm like, they didn't do their job. So mm. another example, like the receptionist, you walk in and the receptionist wouldn't stand up and and greet people with a smile. And I would go to HR and say, no, maybe we can give them a little training so they can make the person who's coming in feel a little bit more welcome. And the person from HR, well, oh, you know, you're right, let's do some training, but nothing would happen. So I would go to the receptions who was not somebody that reported to me, and I would give them something to learn on how to create great experiences for the customers. And I say, listen, when somebody comes in, you may want to get up and smile. So I'm getting involved again in someone who was not uh, someone I was in charge of. And then I would get in trouble. So I was always getting in trouble for getting involved in things that was nothing to do with my responsibility because I looked at the company and I cared so much mm -hmm. and I wanted them to be great, but that came with consequences. So I used to piss off a lot of people. So yeah. I didn't want to be in a corporation that I have to worry because this person is their job and there's, there's no collaboration. Mm. And people get too sensitive about, you know, politics. And um, so I had to go through a lot of that to realize like enough is enough. Like I'm not going through that anymore. Um, Got it. So that's, so, you know, so it was some pain points to be able to get to this point. Right. And feel like enough is enough. I'm ready for this. I have to take a chance. Totally relate to that. So you just, you, 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 all of the pain points created the, the foundation for you saying that you're ready. Correct. This is my time and I'm going to take the bull by the horns. I'm going to start driving the car instead of driving, being a passenger in someone else's car. Correct. Got it. And Got you it. know what book that really helped me? Rich Dad, sure. Poor Dad. Okay. Cause I was the, in the, the meantime. First one, the, the first one? The first one. Wow. Because in the meantime, I was so frustrated when I was working at one of the firms that I started doing bodybuilding to be able to take some of my energy. Because while I was there, I wanted to completely restructure. Remember, I was the number one office. I knew how to create systems. So when I was working one of these offices, we had 360 agents. And I said, can we take some of the systems that I've implemented successfully before and implement them here? And I had some other managers I was working with. They're like, no. We don't want to do anything. And I'm like, oh my God. So I was there feeling useless. I felt like a tiger in a cage. So I needed to be able to find something else to be able to take some of my drive. So I started doing bodybuilding. Mm. So I did a bodybuilding competition. I was, and I was 34 years old competing with 18 year olds. And I was a third, I got number three out of 140 girls. That's awesome. That's unreal. So then I competed again. Then I got first place and then competed again. Then became a North American champion <laughs> as, a, as a hobby, right? Yeah. So. Um, the whole point is I took some of that drive and energy, right. And, um, I converted into, into fitness. And once again, guess how I won. I basically looked for clues on what did the previous winners do? And I studied them and I realized there, you know, because bodybuilding, you have to, there's certain poses you have to make. Your body has to look a certain way. There's a, ba uh, there's a way you wear your hair and your makeup. And I basically studied all the girls who won and I did the same thing. <laughs> uh -huh. There's no secret, really. There's no secret. To yeah. Model but it's hard now. work though. The discipline, having to wake up five o'clock in the morning to train because I had to go to work at nine o'clock every day. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. I had to be in the office at nine. So I would train from five until 6.30 while my kids were still asleep. So... 99% of people drop out because they're not willing to put in the work. Wow. 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 You were committed enough. You were willing to go through the pain, you know, and you had to eat right too. Oh my God. Yeah. A lot. Yeah. Seven times a day and work out six days a week. 
But listen, again, there's a plan. There's a system. I had a fitness coach and the fitness coach said, here is what you do. You just have to follow the plan. Yeah. And, you know, and, and that it's everything in life is like that. There's already success leaves clues. Somebody already did it. You just have to follow the formula. How long did it take for your body to transform? 12 weeks. So four months or yeah, three, three months. months, three months, three months. So your body was transformed in like a physical bodybuilder physique in three months. Yeah. Strict. You must've been extremely strict. Oh yes. You yeah. go to bed hungry every day. Let's yeah. not tell yeah. you, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. you know, but you know, that was something that I did on the side because I had so much drive. So, so when I was training while I was still working in this corporation, I was training. I remember I was starving because I lost 20 pounds for that. I was starving and I still needed to train because I was getting close to the show and I needed to do cardio twice a day. So I had to go five o'clock in the morning and nine o'clock at night when I came back from the office. Mm. Mm. And I was in the Stairmaster because I found the Stairmaster is the hardest thing in the world, I, you know, when you have no carbs. <laughs> and I'm in the Stairmaster and I'm listening to audiobooks and I was listening to Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And I remember like I'm slamming the, the Stairmaster so pissed off at myself. I'm like, I'm so stupid. Here I am, you know, over a decade spending all this energy and time making somebody else rich. I'm so stupid. I remember but I still wasn't ready. I had to go through this. I had to go through this massive change of a company going out of business for me to realize that enough is enough. But wow. that, that book definitely helped me. And yeah. another book that I think is life-changing is How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. Because mm. that puts you, have you read that? I do not think I have. I will definitely be listening to that though. Yeah, because it just, it puts a different perspective because so many of us are so focused on us. And if you put yourself in the other person's shoes, it's just, oh my God, it changed everything. It changed yeah. everything. Yeah. So where are you headed next? Well, um, I am still finalizing the foundation. I mean, my company is great. I am selling, I'm getting a lot of referrals. I have some great luxury listings that I just got. And I've, I've amazing partnerships all over the world. So some of the partnerships I have, like one of them as an example, they have 102 offices all over the world. I'm, I'm the New York uh, branch. Although the, we're different brands, we have alliance partnerships. So I get a lot of referrals from these relationships all over the world. Mm. So that has been great. So there's different ways to build the business, right? So yep. I'm just tapping. I mean, I'm literally the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more to be able to get to the level that I want to. So next will be uh, hiring some amazing people that I can um, spread the wealth and teach them what I've learned and what I've been able, because I was able to literally start from nothing. Because when you're an executive, you know, the managers sit behind a desk. They don't network. They don't do sales. And I was managing agents for 17 years. So when you're managing agents, you don't have a book of business. I had to start all over again. And I, by the way, I already made more per year than I made as a salary when I was an employee. Wow. Wow. So, so you've made, in your one year of being in business, being an entrepreneur, you've made more than, than, than your salary when you were working for someone. Wow. Correct. There's no so, feeling, right? There's no silver, but there's also no floor. <laughs> yes, I love that. When you, I love that. Yeah. So you gotta be, you gotta be ready. You gotta be hungry. Um, you know, and there's always somebody trying to copy you, you know, but one thing that I realize is that most companies where they suffer is that they're not great with marketing and advertising. And that is kind of the way to get, your reputation to be out there for people to know who you are. And that's also how you generate leads. There is how now. You, how did you get good at marketing? So five, I would say maybe six years ago, I, you see, that's the, the trick of surrounding yourself with amazing people, right? So I, I was, I became very good friends with the director of marketing for one of the companies I worked for. And she used to work at Apple. So she got to really experience what was like to work there. 
and the culture and the innovation. And she came to me and she said, wow, you're so amazing. I can't believe how much you do for being such a young woman. And she said to me, you know, what's next for you? And at the time I said, well, I would like to be the CEO of this company or have my own company. And she said to me, well, what are you doing to be able to get there? And I was like, wow, she was 23. And I was like, I don't know how old I was, 30 already. And I'm thinking, wow, she's right. So I started to look into some of the women that had the positions I wanted. And as I started to study them, they had their own brand. They had um, their own logos. They had their own domain and their own website. So I started researching different companies to help me with branding. And then I hired somebody to help me create my logo, build my website. We did a photo shoot. We created a copy and my bio. And I basically started building my brand of being the CEO before I was a CEO. Yes, yes. Right? Yeah. So then I, I started to understand branding. And one of my bosses said to me, you can never build a brand from the bottom up. You should never do it. You should always build a brand from the top down. And it took me, it took me a little while to understand, but then I said, I got it. If you go buy a Hyundai, the Hyundai car has better features than a Mercedes. But a Hyundai, no matter what, will never be a Mercedes. People feel different behind driving because what happened, the perception is they are the inexpensive model and the price is there, it's, it's less. And unfortunately, there's no way of changing perception. And when I was working with City Habitats, it was a great company, but the perception was they were a rental company and there was no way to take that away. They rebranded and I went through that, right? I was there helping them and I, I'm meeting with the companies that did, it's, they, I believe they charge almost a million dollars to rebrand City Habitats. Wow. And I was there watching and I realized that they spent a million dollars and it did absolutely nothing. <sighs> it was a million dollars wasted because it didn't matter. The perception was they were a rental company. So a Mercedes, on the other hand, they are luxury, they are, you know, you're proud to sit behind the wheel, but they have the inexpensive version. But you know why? Because they started as a luxury brand first. And eventually they had the lower class that is affordable. But if, he, if they start as the affordable model first, they would never be the Mercedes that you're proud of to sit behind the wheel. Wow, wow. I learned something, I learned something. That is wild. And you know, so, you, you can't, you can't if, you, if you look at the way the, the, the business works, like that low, that low cost item is also like a low profit item. So like you can't even build a business unless you sell millions and millions and millions of that stuff, which then you're going to overwork a brand new company. So when you start out, you want to start off with the luxury stuff. So when you actually close a deal, you have the resources to actually fulfill on the deal. And so that listen, makes so much sense. Look at city habitats. They're gone. You know how much city habitats that, that NRT paid for city habitats? Uh, I think it was $48 million. They paid $48 million for a brand that now merged with Corcoran. Mm. Now there is no more city habitats mm. because you know what? For the managers, it was exhausting to manage city habitats. You know, yeah. I was managing there for 10 years. It was new agent after new agent after new agent after new agent. And of course, for the CEO and the president, they're not there in the, in the you know, front lines dealing with everything. They don't care. They're still making millions of dollars, but for the managers who are sitting in the front lines dealing with everything, it's, it's exhausting. Yeah. The right? rental game is tough. The rental game is, is but I mean, it, if you want to be an entrepreneur and you want to be able to juggle a bunch of different things at the same time, it's like there's no better starting place than right there, you know? Yeah. I definitely feel because I learned so much from rentals and the fast pace of a rental game, you know, I can do the sales with no issues because I am on top of my game. Yeah. Because you can't miss a beat with the rental business. Yeah. But or when you start in sales, yeah, when you start in sales, 
it's slow and you can negotiate and you get away. You got the co-op package to put together. You have 30 days and, and then that's very different. So when you try to go work on a rental deal, they, they're not fast enough. Yeah. They can't yeah. handle it. <laughs> well, I love speaking with you and I know you're going to be amazing when you go and build your team. I mean, there were so many of the stories that you share with me. I'm over here almost crying. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, this virtual thing, I'm so happy that you're really, you're doing this virtual because like I, I'm literally feeling the energy going back and forth, even though we are virtual. So uh, I feel like I know you forever. You see, this is the thing people don't realize. I just did two deals that the person never stepped foot into the property. Wow. Wow. Listen, there's two things that I can't replace is how it smells and also the feeling of the ceiling height, but I can still tell them what the ceiling height is. But the, the, how it smells, it's not, so the, the, the buyers has, they have to rely on me to know that, but everything else between the virtual reality tours and everything, like you can eliminate 90% of the physical showings by doing it virtually. And mm. um, so, I'm, so next for me, I don't know if I answer your question, uh, expanding, you know, hiring people that are really successful or are really good at what they do, or they have the drive that I have, which is not easy to find. And, 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 um, and one thing that sets me apart is that I have a network of high net worth individuals and sports entertainment clients. And that's who I, I cater to because the very luxurious home, they also require a high net worth or a sports entertainment client to purchase that home. So I'm connecting the two. Got it. And my ultimate goal as a company is to sell the most luxurious homes all over the world. Love it. I love it. How do people get in contact with you? Well, uh, my website is theluxian.com, T-H-E-L-U-X-I-A-N. And they can call me at 917-567-8767. You're a rock star. And this conversation has been unbelievable. And, and um, I look forward to continuing to watch you grow and see the what you actually create, you know, you're, you're an inspiring person. You have me over here totally inspired. So I <laughs> Don't you wish it. I was your manager when you were at Bond? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 100%. <laughs> hey there. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please click subscribe down below and give me a thumbs up. You can reach out to me on Instagram or Facebook at Oliver Fernandez three. I have new videos just like this one dropping every week. So drop a comment down below and let me know what you want to hear next. Until then, keep growing and keep learning. Just do it.